Welcome everybody to Sportico Live. This edition, we examine the valuations of major league soccer clubs and kicking it off, we are joined by the commissioner of MLS, Don Garber. Don, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here, guys, and uh, congratulations on everything that you're doing. And uh, it's a great sort of hats off to entrepreneurs in a space that is important for all of us in the sports industry. So look forward to some fun together. Uh, you, are, you are too kind. Of course, I'll turn it over to Evan Novi williams in a moment. Later on, I'll be talking with Jason Levy of DC United. We have Kurt Badenhausen, who did all the heavy lifting on these valuations with the owners of LAFC, Larry Berg and Peter Guber. But Don, let me ask you one overarching 30,000 foot view question before I turn it over to Eben. The reaction to 800 plus million dollar valuations, I'm not sure that man on the street would have seen, let me see, one, two, three teams eclipsing an $800 million valuation in MLS. So you take that away and then I'll turn it over to Ed. You know, pleased uh, at it, Scott. You know, you look at those teams that are, that are uh, valued uh, at that level, a lot of investment, uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of commitment to building a fan base locally, creating relevance in their markets, driving revenue, significance, right? And that's what sports teams got to do to be successful, to matter to partners, to fans, to, you know, the community. Uh, and, uh, you know, take the top LAFC, you go to one of those games, man, it's one of the great sporting events uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, there's an enormous buzz about it. And that buzz is leading to, you know, an increased value to that team as they've been raising money and re recapitalizing their their structure. So I'm, I'm proud of, uh, of all of our clubs and and really pleased to see where valuations are. I'm excited to have this conversation now, Don, because it seems like such an interesting time. On one hand, we're 18 months into a pandemic that has been especially hard on sports and entertainment franchises and, and leagues that rely heavily on tickets like MLS does. On the other hand, valuations have never been higher as, as we're talking about. In your assessment, the health of MLS right now, give me kind of a breakdown of how you balance soaring valuations with what has been obviously a difficult time pandemic-wise. Well, you know, listen, last year was a tough one for us, for, for every sports league or anybody in our industry, but certainly probably for every business here around the world. Uh, but we got through it, and we got through it because of the strength and stability of the league today. I think if we were faced with uh, the COVID pandemic, five years ago, I'm not quite sure we'd be uh, as as confident and, and frankly, as uh, as strong as we are uh, sitting here today. Uh, you know, we, we took a big revenue hit. We are uh, primarily a, a ticket driven business, but, you know, we got into the bubble in Orlando and we were able to deliver for our partners. We got back into our markets. We were able to sell some tickets later in the year. We had our final in front of home fans in Columbus. I mean, think about that. The only league to be in a uh, a bubble, go back into uh, our home markets and then have a hosted final. And, and all of that sort of has, has led to, uh, I'd say, strength to strength, uh, Evan. We, uh, our partners stood by us, our banks stood by us, our owners stood by us, our fans stood by us and empowering the 2021-26 uh, the season for Major League Soccer. So financially, you know, I'd always love to drive more revenue and have bigger media deals and have higher ticket prices and sell more Adidas merchandise uh, on Fanatics or in our stores. But uh, we're feeling pretty good about where we are today. We'll get into all those things. I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned five years ago, this might've been a different conversation. The, the league is bigger now than it was five years ago, of course, but but what's been the big change that you think, what is MLS doing now that, that makes it a bit more insular to a lot of these problems than it would have you been? Know, it's a really good question. Years. I think scale is a part of it, right? You have more owners, you have more cities, you have more fans. We broadened uh, our entire perspective, not just sort of how we think about our business, but where we're touching down in our markets. So when you think about MLS expansion, a story I'm sure we'll talk about, it was creating these circles around big markets uh, in the United States and Canada and small markets as well, but connecting those concentric circles so that you can create a, a web of a national fan base. And as we had more owners, there's more commitment, there's more infrastructure, there's more uh, investment, there are more fans, there's more relevance in our community, there's, there's more buzz around Major League Soccer that leads to greater investment, greater investment capital obviously gives you more strength and, uh, and, a, and a bit more stability. 
How do you view expansion kind of in this conversation about the growth over the past 15, 20 years? Obviously, every time there's a new expansion fee paid that gets split up among the owners, they're also diluting themselves in, in, in the global pool of, of MLS shares, more or less. How important has that been? And, and as a second part of the question, does that continue? Are you happy at, at 30? Is where do yeah. you think about kind of turning that spigot off? So when I came into the league, you know, I remember sitting down with Phil Anschutz and Robert Kraft and them saying, hey, you know, we, we put $5 million uh, to start this league. Uh, and right now we're leading into a point where we're not sure we're going to be able to continue to operate the business the way it was originally structured. The league had operated three teams. So Mark Abbott, our president, would, you know, go from one office and make a trade with himself and have to go in the other office. That's really not true, but it's kind of cute. Uh, we had to get out of league operated teams and we, we folded uh, uh, teams as you well know. And then it was a couple of years from 2002 before we even had expansion again. And that happened in, in uh, Salt Lake and it happened in our second team in Los Angeles. And those expansion fees were $5 million, right? And today, <laughs> David Tepper paid three hundred and twenty-five million dollars, and we have teams valued over eight, valued at over eight hundred million dollars. That really isn't the point, right? Expansion is about growing a fan base. It's about creating connections in the community. It's about growing the significance and relevance of your league and the sport overall uh, in North America and influencing around the world. It's about creating a commercial market. I mean, right? We started Soccer United Marketing many years ago to raise the commercial value of soccer in our country. And now you could argue we're the most valuable soccer market commercially in the world. And none of that could have ha happened if not expanding our ownership group from the original handful to the many, many owners, you know, almost 50 people on the MLS Board of Governors. And that influence, that idea sharing, uh, that commitment is what's driven MLS to the values where we are today for this uh, conference, but most importantly, to make Major League Soccer what it is in terms of its its significance in the world of, of global football. And all of that would not have happened if we didn't grow beyond the three or four original owners. Yeah. And, and the makeup of those owners has changed a lot. Also, I mean, I'm, it's not lost on me that in the past three years, you've added three billionaire families that also own NFL teams. I would imagine the conversation that you have among owners has also changed a bit as the makeup of the ownership also changes. Yeah. You know, again, I, I, I talk about this sort of a lot when we, we speak internally about the evolution of how the league needs to manage its board, right? And it was it was both easier, but at times odd and, and uh, almost surreal to have one owner own six teams at one point and another owner own three teams and then one owner own one, right? Board meetings were easier, but you know, that's not a proper sports league. It would not uh, continue to exist, obviously, if we were structured that way. Uh, diversity of thought is what is the most important aspect of the new owners over the last 10 years. And whether it's Hank Paulson coming in and thinking about governance perhaps differently than we did in the past, or it's the guys in LA, LAFC, Larry Berg and, and his partners, Brandon Beck and Bennett Rosenthal and Peter Guber, you know, brilliant guys in sports and finance who are thinking about building a uh, a sports team in a great market with a great downtown stadium at a time 20 years after MLS was founded, right? Having Man City, the owners of Man City coming in and the owners of the Red Bulls with multiple, you know, footholds in global uh, soccer or global football, having the, the most female owners representing our teams than any other league, having a number of diverse owners that could help us think about all the different things that are going on in the sports world today, perhaps differently than we would have 10 years ago, all of that is what makes NFL such a rich, contextual uh, sports league. The last thing that I'll add to that, which is important, is thinking about the succession of ownership. We have a bunch of young owners. You know, we've got a guy like Merritt Paulson in his 40s or Anthony Precourt, 35,000 season ticket waiting list in Austin. Matthew McConaughey and Eddie Margain, these guys are in their 40s. And they think about sport and the long-term investment of uh, Major League Soccer perhaps differently than, you know, maybe one of our older, more established owners that owns NFL teams have might think about the business. 
for sure. And I, I think about kind of the economics of, of most major sports leagues as being fairly similar. There's local revenue, there's ticket sales, there's national revenue, there's media. The, the numbers are vary in size and the percentage buckets may vary in size, but the, the business is kind of similar. One thing I think that sticks out about MLS is when you look at the valuations and, and, and particularly the multiplier on revenue, what people are paying right now, it's way higher than it is in other leagues. Pressure might not be the right word, but but do you feel as though right now for MLS, there's the, the valuations are baked into an expectation of, of, of growth in a way that exists in other leagues, but maybe not to the degree that it does right now for, for soccer in America? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I think I brought in over 20 of our owners, you know, maybe more. Uh, and at no time do we get into a discussion on revenue multiples. You know, what they're thinking about is, what does the team cost today from an investment? What's required to continue to invest in that uh, club, in its facilities, in building a fan base, and in ensuring that you've got the right staff to build the opportunity or capture the opportunity? And then what will that look like in time? And it's interesting, and you know, just uh, having spent, I spent a lot of my time with our owners and investors, new investors in particular, and when you could talk to one about might have bought an NBA team recently and the MLS team that he's looking at purchasing is cost valued more and will cost more than the NBA team that he bought six years ago. Hmm. What does that really mean? It means that look at what that NBA team is valued today. It's almost 5x what he paid for. And that same theory would apply to his MLS team would exponentially grow in value. And why? Why? Because the opportunity is still ahead of us. Our best days are still ahead. Our, we have the youngest, most diverse fan base in all of professional sports. What will that look like in three years, five years, 10 years, in 20 years? We have the World Cup coming here in 2026. How will that empower and drive and energize uh, this great opportunity? Global football is becoming more uh, relevant and more prevalent you know, throughout the sports industry here today. What will that mean in terms of value? When you think about our new teams, you know, St. Louis has 50,000 season ticket deposits in a 20,000 seat stadium and they don't play for two years. So those are unheard of numbers. Charlotte playing next year, 35,000 season tickets. These are things that we couldn't have expected to happen. And frankly, when I look back on it for the people that have bought those teams years ago, if I probably thought they'd be worth what they are today. Maybe we didn't do a good job in pricing those teams when we sold an <laughs> expansion team. So, <laughs> Yeah, too bad you can't go back and uh, raise that thing retroactively. Don, you mentioned in there the World Cup. You know, I've heard, you know, you, you've talked for, for years about the benefit of, of the 2026 World Cup. Um, the last World Cup, men's World Cup that was hosted in America was essentially the launching point for MLS as a whole. Walk me through how hosting the biggest event in, in global soccer here in the U S benefits from a business standpoint, MLS. You know, I don't, I don't think there is a business anywhere that could look, have a forward look Evan of what will that business look like? What will the market look like? What will the opportunity be five years from now? I don't care what company it is. We know today that five years from now, the World Cup will be in the United States. It will be in 12 markets in the US. It'll be in Mexico, it'll be Canada. We have teams in Canada, we have a competition going with Mexico. So what is it that we can do to take advantage of the biggest sporting event in the world that we know will happen? We know what the date's gonna be. We, we now can prepare, how do we get our cities energized and involved? What do we need to do to get sponsors, new sponsors that might be thinking about global football and now they're Global football is going to be turning its attention to the U.S., Canada, and Mexico in 2026. How could we have a lead up to that moment? What can we do to build a fan base, knowing that we've got all these folks that are going to be tied into the drama, the thrill of victory, and all the all of the agonies of defeat that happens in and around you know the World Cup? All those things will empower uh, the opportunity for us. And I will, I will say, I, mean, I don't think that this is driving MLS values. I just think it's one of the many fact uh, points that are, you know, things that we could uh, point to that are allowing Major League Soccer teams to capture the, the values that they are today, uh, because it is a forward thinking, best days ahead approach to what uh, it is that people are thinking about when they're making an investment in MLS. 
we had Mark yeah. Lazary, the co-owner of the Bucks, on our podcast earlier this week, um, and he bought the Milwaukee Bucks back in 2014. He and Wes Edens paid $550 million. It was a record at the time. People thought they were crazy. Uh, and flash forward seven years, he's an NBA champion. The team's worth $1.8 billion. Um, and he's laughing, right? He, he, he knew things that I think a lot of people didn't. One of the things he said that he felt was that the revenue was about to, particularly on the media side, was about to explode. He knew the TV contracts were up. He had a good idea that the next round of media negotiations was going to be very fruitful for the league. You guys are kind of in a similar position now. You're in the market right now, starting to talk about your next media uh, deals. Right now, you're with Fox, Univision, and ESPN. How important is this next round for you guys? And, and how important is getting a kind of a hefty rights increase versus what you have right now? You know, it's a, it's, it's a great question. So, you know, the answer to the last part of the question, it's very important, right? Uh, we continue to uh, uh, get... Uh, engage with our current partners, as you mentioned, ESPN, ABC, the Disney family of companies, uh, Fox and Univision. Uh, but we're looking at a world that's dramatically changing. You know that we're we're living in a world of of, of streaming direct to consumer uh, programming. MLS fans uh, index higher than than other sports league fans because they're younger. Uh, they're probably more cable ne cable nevers than cable cutters. So. Uh, soccer fans generally, you could ask NBC this question or ask Paramount uh, CBS folks this question, very likely to engage in a new subscription for uh, a streaming service to follow their favorite soccer teams or favorite, favorite leagues or favorite competitions. So that plays into uh, empowering our uh, excitement, enthusiasm and confidence as to what this will look like uh, uh, as we go through these negotiations over the next 12 months. But I think it's important to, to point out that when people are making this investment, they're not thinking about the next deal. They're thinking about what will this look like generationally? What will look mm -hmm. like probably the deal after that? What will MLS look like, not just in the next three, four, or eight years, but what will it look like in the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, so I will say probably different perhaps than, uh, than an NBA owner might have made before the, the last unbelievably spectacular media deal uh, is thinking about all the touch points, all the revenue buckets uh, that will grow over time without doubt. Nobody doubts that MLS's revenues will grow. And when you think generationally, is there a point where you think MLS is, is bringing in more on the media side than it is on the game day revenue side? Is that a, a ratio that you don't think flips at any point soon? Kind of how do you think about those? those you know, it's funny, I've, I've never thought about where that tipping point is between game day revenues and and media revenues, you know, I, I look at the baseball model, they got a lot of game day revenue, they've got a lot of games, and they've got a lot of media revenues. I kind of like that, right? So, you know, <laughs> Both our goal is a good answer. <laughs> is as much revenue as we possibly can. You know, we're getting into a unique dynamic in ways that are kind of cool because we didn't expect it. We didn't expect last weekend 67,000 people in Atlanta or their average of, you know, about 40 to 50,000 or those kind of numbers in Seattle and similar numbers uh, that I'm sure we're going to see in Charlotte. So because we, we went from big stadiums to building soccer stadiums, 20, 22,000, and now we have a number of markets that are playing in NFL stadiums. So, you know, game day revenues will still be a big part of our dynamic. We have, you know, 34 games that we're playing. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for us to drive that, but we clearly do need to drive our media revenue no different than any other sports league. One thing we have to talk about when we talk about the media side, Soccer United Marketing, the marketing arm for, for MLS for a long time, and including the current TV deal that you guys are under, includes rights to U.S. soccer. Moving forward under this next negotiation, you guys are separating. You guys are no longer managing the media rights for, for U.S. soccer. How does that affect uh, both the, the media deal you guys are looking at and also kind of the valuation and business side of, of, of these teams. I, I've talked to a number of owners who have invested over the past 10 years in MLS. A lot of people point to Soccer United Marketing, the equity they get in that as virtue of being an MLS owner as one of the things that's really valuable to them. How, how does MLS move forward without U.S. soccer in that portfolio? Well, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question and it's a great story. You know, when we formed Soccer United Marketing in, in uh, 2002, we did it out of necessity. FIFA could not sell, believe it or not, the English language World Cup rights for the 02 and the 06 uh, World Cups in Korea, Japan, and in Germany. So we went out and said, well, we'll buy it. And then we went and packaged MLS rights and US soccer rights. 
neither property was getting paid for its media. So it was at the right time, the right thing to do. As we've evolved over the last you know, 20 odd years, uh, we don't need the US soccer intellectual property and they don't need us. Hmm. So it was not a driver of our economics. You know, it was more strategic, Evan, than it was financially. The driver of some revenues dramatically are the MLS intellectual property rights, our media rights, our local media rights, national media rights, our sponsorship rights, our, our, um, li our licensing or merchandising rights, our rights from the Mexican Federation. We just had, you know, we're, we're promoting the Gold Cup going on now. We're, we're doing incredibly well, generating more revenue there than by far than we did on our representation of the sponsorship rights and media rights for U.S. soccer. So, uh, you know, I think it's a natural evolution. We were their agency. And what's the best example of doing a great job when you're an agent? You know, the people bring it in-house. I'm on the board of U.S. soccer. I support their decision. I wish them luck. Uh, I, uh, I, I don't think it will have any impact whatsoever on the value of Sark United marketing whatsoever, frankly. Gotcha. Interesting. And I got a few other ones I want to want to mention before we go or before I let you go. Uh, one thing we've seen across uh, almost all the major sports in the past 18 months, they're becoming more open to private equity investments. The NBA may be the, the, the most obvious version of this. They've approved a few funds. I think there's six or seven teams at this point that have taken investments. I understand that, that owners at MLS have considered at least opening uh, opening things up to allow private equity investors. Can you give us an update on where that stands? Is that something that's allowed right now, something that might be allowed in the future? Sure. So, you know, I think the NBA, baseball, MLS have all looked at sort of changing our uh, our ownership rules to allow for, you know, private equity investment to come into the league. I think it's smart. You know, we did, I mean, I know you know this well, you know, we did uh, have uh, Providence Equity make an investment in Soccer United Marketing years ago. Mm -hmm. That was, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. It was allowing us to take a piece of equity in a company that was wholly owned by the MLS owners, use that money to to drive a lot of opportunity. And then ultimately we bought them out, it worked out well for them. And it worked out well for the major league soccer owners. Uh, I think you're going to see so much, there's so much money in the marketplace right now. And to be able to get some of the really smart people in the business to invest without a path to control, uh, without uh, anything other than capturing the appreciation, with, and there's been a lot of appreciation, sports teams, particularly in major league soccer, makes sense. So I think you'll see more and more of it. You'll see it in Major League Soccer in deals that could conceivably get announced uh, pretty soon. But I'm a big fan of it. I love the guys that are talking to us, and uh, I think it'll be good for our clubs. Has that rule change officially happened? I mean, if I was an MLS team right now? We, we haven't closed any deals yet, but the rule change happened last year. And I think you'll see a number of deals happen over the next 12 months for sure. Got it. Interesting. Yeah, I find that to be a really interesting, one of the more interesting trends across our business in the past 18 months is, is the fact that, you know, yeah. a lot of leagues like yours, like the NBA did not allow this, you know, two years ago. And now because of there's obviously capital constraints because of COVID. Yeah. And I would also say too, I mean, you know, these people, the, the look, look at Mark Lazary and Wes Edens in Milwaukee, just to pick the NBA champions, two financial guys, right? Uh, we have a number of, of uh, uh, folks from the private equity world uh, or in the hedge fund world that are, owning teams in Major League Soccer, and they're coming into these leagues, and they have a perspective that I think is a bit different than the sports industrialists. Mm. Those that were the original pro sports team owners, you know, back in the day, and we have many of them that are still- yeah, like Crafts office. and Hunts, is that the- yeah, the Crafts and Hunts, and Arthur Blank, and, you know, Stan Kroenke, these guys are, you know, the foundational owners in MLS, Cliff Illig and his partners in Kansas City. Uh, and then you start seeing the, the new, owners coming in, many of them are younger. And, you know, financial people aren't just about money, right? They're thinking of their, that these are their limited companies, their investments that they're making. They, they sit on those boards and they're, they're smart, right? So, and then when they go and, and want to make investments in sports, yes, it's a financially uh, a positive thing to be able to get the right uh, deal and the right partners in, but there's also some strategic value. 
there's another class of, of, of minority owner in MLS that's getting a lot of attention, the celebrity uh, owners. Uh, it seems like MLS has done a, a really good job of courting from Matthew McConaughey to Mark Ingram. Uh, there, there's LAFC. I feel like the entire ownership group uh, fit, fits that category. Um, Kevin Durant, another one that pops out. Um, why do you think MLS has been kind of particularly, it seems, uh, attractive to, to, to people like that? You know, I think it starts I mean, they, that there, there's there's a lot of, of athletes, start with athletes that have uh, acquired great wealth, right? So James Harden is a good example who uh, made an, a significant investment in Houston and then in that team just recently sold, he stayed in. You know, James is just, he's a smart guy, right? really smart, he's got great advisors and sees value in MLS and uh, he's smart and wants to sort of learn the business. and. I'm, I'm meeting more and more with, with athletes that have great managers and looking to diversify their investments, but also their sports guys, right? So that they really bring to their ownership a perspective of fan development and, uh, and management of intellectual property or what a brand might look like in ways that are positive. And then you get guys like, like Will Farrell or Matthew. They're just fun, right? I mean, Will Farrell and Matthew are deeply engaged in helping to promote their teams because they love the club. I mean, it's it's th this is not just a vanity investment. I mean, Will Farrell is working and, and Matthew is working, right? And that is just incredibly awesome. I mean, they they brought the cast for Ted Lasso to the most recent LAFC mm. and they were in the stands going crazy. I mean, it was just a great marketing opportunity uh, to build that brand and connect it to something that's culturally relevant. And I think you'll see more and more of that. Today we announced uh, uh, Patrick Mahomes just made an investment in uh, Sporting Kansas City. Local guy, his, uh, his wife played the game. You know, he's a fan. He's gone to U.S. national team games. He's come to Sporting Kansas City games. Why not make an investment in it and sit in some way around uh, the ownership table and learn about maybe he'll learn enough to buy a team outright, whether that's an NFL team, an NBA team, or an MLS team. One of the things I find so interesting about this kind of class of investor is that in a lot of other sports, we generally see minority stakes sell at kind of a discount because you don't get, usually you don't get control to ownership. It's just a, it's just a minority passive stake. Uh, in MLS, it feels like we're seeing almost the opposite. We, we reported on Mark Ingram's DC United deal. I think the valuation there was $715 million, something right in that range for a very small piece of DC. I'm curious why you think that it seems like in MLS, at least the, the LP stakes don't, don't actually sell for a discount uh, in the way that they do in other places. Yeah, you know, I, I do think it's about, you know, the owner of that team didn't have to sell anything, right? So if you're going to come in and uh, the, the valuation really should be at what that team would be worth, it was going to be sold, right? Because it's not, it, 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 it in essence is, it's the story with, with MLS, you're, you're selling the future. Uh, and, and, and Mark came in, what a great owner he will be, great partner that he'll be with Steve Kaplan and, and Jason Levy and, and a great valuation for that team. You know, they're, they're building a, uh, and they built a great stadium. They're now in the process of building a great training ground. They're in a top market. Their facility is perfectly located. They've got development rights around it. They're going to have a sports betting, uh, possibility or an opportunity connected to their stadium. The brand is strong and relevant. So all those things create value. And if you want to come in, you know, it's going to be uh, at a price or at a value that that owner is willing to sell at minority or, you know, a larger piece. We've got a few minutes left, but I want to also ask you about Mexico. Um, we had some DC United, as you're just describing, some of their investors just bought a team down in Mexico. You guys have been working with Liga MX on various partnerships and cups for a long time. I know there's been talks of a, of a merger. Can you give us an update on, on kind of where that stands, what you see as potentially in the tea leaves for Liga MX and, and MLS moving forward? Yeah, I mean, nothing but opportunity. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can't sit here today and say ultimately what that's going to look like 10 years from now. What I'll tell you in the short term, you know, in a, in a few weeks, we'll be playing our All-Star game against the MLS, uh, the League of Mex All-Stars. So, you know, there uh, we'll have two of their biggest stars in Carlos Vela and Chicharito playing for Major League Soccer, right? Not for League of Mex. I mean, how cool is that? And, uh, and you're going to see more and more programming between our two leagues. And, and I think that programming will be really, really exciting and really valuable. 
the idea that you could create intra-league competition between Liga MX that's got a big fan base and MLS has got a big fan base, offering something that no other league in North America can offer, which is cross-border competition uh, with, uh, you know, with meaningful matches. You know, they're not regular season matches, but it's a meaningful competition. There'll be prize money. Uh, and, uh, and I think it'll capture an enormous uh, amount of opportunity for both our leagues. I'm very excited about it. I'm jumping in here, Eben. One, to say I must be the only fool who hasn't seen Ted Lasso. I'll wait till the whole thing's done and I'll binge it in a weekend. But two, hey, Don, I don't want to embarrass Eben, but you know, can I scold him while we're doing this together here? Of course you can. I mean, it works for you. Works with you, man. Yeah, great, great. No, we have to make this. We have to make this fun, right? You All mentioned right. Mark Lassery, right? Yeah. And Eben said nothing. Who is our podcast guest today? Oh, he mentioned it. I did mention it. Oh, you yeah, did. Was I not looking? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you, just you just scolded yourself. <laughs> great. I, I, hey, somebody has to scold me. If it's me on myself, that's fine. Great. Because you, you were not You were paying attention, man. And congratulations great. to Mark and, and Wes. I mean. What a great story for the NBA and a great brand. I'm friendly with Wes and what they've done to turn that team around and build a beautiful stadium, rebrand the club. It's it's identity, not its brand. It's fabulous. Yeah. It's a great story. I like small markets winning championships. Yeah, you talked about the private equity owner. It was great. He said during our podcast, all he asked Peter Fagan, his president, to do was double revenue. That's it. Just a simple <laughs> task. That was the simple task. And by the way, win a championship while doing it. So all, so all good there. And a quick uh, David Stern story, because I love these media discussions that you're having with Eben, and you're talking 2X, 3X streaming. I'll never forget David telling me his first broadcast deal where the NBA took money. He said the network called him and said, we'd like to pay you for your games, whereas previously the, you know, there was no rights fee that we know today. And David said, I was smart enough to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. I will say yes. Deal. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, Don, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Great conversation with you and Eben. Uh, we, we do appreciate it. And I'm also glad that you mentioned LAFC because coming up next, we're going to have Kurt Bodenhausen's conversation with two of the owners of LAFC, uh, Larry Berg and Peter Guber, the most valuable team in MLS. Great. I think you'll have a lot of fun. They're wonderful guys. Thank you. So, LAFC, feels like you guys have been around forever, but here you are. It's only your fourth season. We value the club $860 million, number one among, among all MLS clubs. You guys, do we get the number right, and do we get the order right? Yeah, Peter. No, no. <laughs> I, uh... I'm too smart. I've been in this damn game too long. Not the lead. <laughs> I definitely look. I definitely think you got the order right. I think LAFC certainly, in our view, is the premier team in the league. I think we have a great soccer-specific stadium where we've invested probably more than anybody. I think we have a roster that's very competitive. We went on the field, um, and we have just a terrific emotional connection with our fans. Um, I think the the experience at the stadium is they tell us probably the best sports experience in Los Angeles. Um, you know, the games are sold out. We have some other assets. We do like 15 concerts a year. Uh, we do movie premieres. We have great digital billboards. We have some other assets that come to the table. And I'm not smart enough to know if the valuation is exactly on. Um, you know, is it too high? Is it too low? I don't really know. But I think you got the order right. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, I, I talked to Larry Friedman about this. I mean, you guys get a lot of attention for the celebrities that, that are part of your ownership group. But Larry was talking about uh, the deep roster of sports business executives that are part of your ownership group, which is a, a tr tremendous advantage. I mean, I guess if you could speak to that, where you, you have a question uh, and, and yourself obviously included, Peter, you have a deep background, whether you're talking about venues, media, technology, uh, you, you can pick up the phone and just go through your ownership Rolodex and tap an expert in that area, right? Well, you're right and wrong. The idea is you bring your own experience and intellectual capital to your your partners, to, to Larry and Bennett and Brandon and the whole organization. And you have uh, reputational capital you can reach into, whether it's the Dodgers or the Warriors or our esports team. And you also have the media touches. So you always want to bring uh, other than just financial capital, there's other kinds of capital that are really important uh, to your management group, your ownership group, uh, and to the fans and 
for sure, because at the end of the day, the business we're in is location-based entertainment. We, uh, we have to get butts in seats. We have to provide in a competitive market a real pull, a real attraction to fans to come and come again and really get a great experience in the venue. That's our main job. Winning on the field is also an important job. Being competitive is also an important job. But we have to have both the attitude and aptitude of both those sides to make it work. It is, after all, not called show show. It's called show business. <laughs> Well, I mean, you point out the market. I mean, you guys are in a very crowded market. You're talking about pro sports, college sports. You got the beach. I mean, so, so, so how do you carve out a niche for LAFC uh, to make an engaging product that, that, that people want to be a part of? Well, Harry, you want to try that? Sure. Look, I think in our case, um, a lot of it's about authenticity. We we're obviously in a great market. We know it's a, a diverse market. But we've also known that other soccer teams have failed there. Um, so you have to do it right. Um, I think in our case, the, the secret sauce was co-creating it with our fans, uh, certainly our super mm -hmm. fans, our supporters. We, uh, we started off with a, with a small group. Um, we did everything from send them to Dortmund to see what the uh, folks in the yellow wall are like. We did drum and song sessions in the parking lots when, um, when the stadium was being built. And on day one, it was incredible. Next thing you knew, we had you know, thousands of people in the North End chanting and singing. And I think that atmosphere and I think that emotional connection is very contagious. Um, and I think it leads to all of the other fans being fascinated by what's going on there. So I think that was a big that was a big part of it for us. And yes, it is a very crowded market and you need to seek relevancy. Um, and in order to do that, we wanted to have a good team, a great stadium and huge, huge uh, support from the local community. And uh, we've been able to do all those things. Larry, I saw last year you said you thought MLS would surpass the NHL and MLB in terms of the national sports pecking order uh, over the next 10 years. You sticking with that timeline? So, uh, yes, with the exception of COVID, which I think did cost us a year um, where it was hard to make any progress. Um, I think the big question is surpass on which metric? Well, we never really talked about which metric that is. Right. And there's a lot of different metrics. There's popularity, there's revenues, there's TV ratings, there's value to teams. Um, I looked at how you guys value teams. We're clearly uh, already competitive with NHL, certainly at the low end. Um, mm -hmm. And we are a fraction of MLB at the low end, but I feel like, you know, 25%, a third of their value and we're growing. And so you look at things like the demographics, we're clearly young and diverse. I know Don Garber spoke about that uh, right before us. I mean, the MLB has, uh, I think, 17 years higher age for their average age, 57 versus 40. That's a major difference. Gen Z is uh, one of the most popular sports is soccer. We know we're going to be behind uh, football and basketball, um, but we're the next most popular for the, for the young folks. And it's very diverse. Um, so I think if you if you look at it all uh, and you look at what makes our sport unique, uh, you know, club and country is a very different thing in soccer than you see in the other sports. Um, the academies where you're bringing in kids who are 11 years old and training them as, to be professionals and then signing up as as professionals at 16 from your area, from your homegrown area. These are all fascinating things that the uh, sports fans getting used to. And then they're coming to our stadiums. Um, and the experience is like no other. And by the way, it doesn't hurt that we're two hours in and out, right? Baseball tends to drag. These, these games are long. So um, I think between the World Cup, uh, between the uh, media deals, which need to get higher, and then reinvest that in rosters, um, I think we're going to get there. But I'll hold off on the exact metrics to give myself some wiggle room. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. You, you brought up TV and, and, and the everybody's trying to figure out what the TV landscape's looking like uh, and streaming will certainly be a part of that. And Peter, I'm wondering maybe if you could address you guys in terms of MLS clubs, who are certainly out front in that with your, your deal with YouTube, uh, which you signed right out of the gates uh, when the franchise uh, came aboard in 2018 to play. I, I guess if you could speak to that, now you're back on linear TV, if you could speak to that experience in terms of what you thought worked and, and then what, didn't necessarily work uh, as a streaming product for your club. You know, I, I'm not Karnak. I can't, I can't you know, predict, the, you know, all, all the forces that are working this thing. But one force you can really predict is that we're going to have a one-to-one -one relationship with our fans, and streaming is the way to have that one-to-one -one relationship. 
you not only <clears throat> um, uh, it's not just one way it's two ways and you're interactive with them and you that relationship capital trumps all of the other elements in the other kinds of media it, it, while you crowdsource around uh, national TV and other kinds of, of broadcast media the individual media which looks like the plot de jour is going to be what everybody does when you have a whole host of games a continuity of programs over eight or nine month season you are a force to be reckoned with and every one of the media companies knows that that is a, 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 a critical aspect continuity programming where you're covered on the news where you're covered on the sports page where you just don't just have audiences you have fans they're ignited by it and the idea is this media is very different than other media you know movies are streamed and and television shows are streamed but remember sports are different the sports fan even watching on television even on television or I say television even on uh, computer the sports fan is an active participant in the outcome he or she believes they make a difference and in live in the in the actual theater of the game they do make a difference so the idea is we we occupy a unique asset now, how it'll be exploited and what the best form of it'll be, whether it's single purchases, whether it's a bundle, whether it's you know all streams, all games, I can't answer that question. I'm not I'm not a seer, but I can say this: the the future is bright. You have to just get a little lucky, like always, and not and not pick something too early that is you're going to have to sit on the sideline. My own opinion is that the media rights will become unbelievably valuable. Um, for MLS and for our team. Okay. I, I hear from a lot of people, uh, they, they talk about for MLS to catch up, they got to spend more money, got to raise the talent level uh, to compete with other clubs. Do you guys think that's, that's a fair uh, assessment? Look, I think that's always fair. Um, I don't think it's a salary cap problem per se or self-imposed limits. I think it's a, it's a revenue issue. We have to keep, um, you know, pursuing the slow growth uh, dynamic. You can't overdo it or you might be like the NASL, um, mm -hmm. but you have to continue to move the revenue needle, media rights and otherwise. I think sports gambling is going to do a lot for us, which is one of the reasons streaming is going to be very exciting. And then as you, as you increase your media rights and other rights, including sponsorships, Adidas, for example, was a huge sponsorship for the league. And then you take that money and you reinvest it um, in better rosters. Uh, I don't think you can get ahead of yourself. And as you improve the roster, um, it, it moves the needle. So it becomes a flywheel. And I will say, I think we've become, even only in the last five, six years, competitive in, in South America with those players. So now players throughout South America look at the MLS as a wonderful place to be versus their home countries. I think the same thing's happening in Africa, but it hasn't happened yet in Europe because Europe media revenues are much higher. So I feel like we're kind of slowly, methodically, uh, you know, improving our, our where we stand in different parts of the of the world, and we just have to keep doing it. Got it, Peter. I'm wondering. Um, we're seeing a lot of teams use their clubs, <clears throat> excuse me, as that kind of tentpole item as they move into other related businesses, whether whether that's media or obviously real estate developments. And you you guys have done it with the Warriors. There's talk about what the Dodgers might do. Uh, what as we look forward with LAFC out again, I'm going to make you play Karnak here. We look out 10, 20 years. I mean, how do you take LAFC and then, you know, the success of the, the brand has had already. Are, are there other areas that you guys look at and, and Larry, feel free to chime in too. Are there other areas that you can take that brand again, as we look out uh, way down the road? I would say, Larry is a, a builder and his partners, all of our partners are builders and have built all kinds of enterprises in media, in real estate, in finance, every way. And so those are the resources that are going to be used. We have to act locally. We have to build our team. We have to build our relationship with our fans. We have to create a very vibrant, you know, location based entertainment experience. That's really game one. You know, you have to, we have to build that. When, when we build that relationship with our fans, other opportunities exist. And I think also when we become more robust with our financing, financial structure with the team itself, other opportunities like they do with the other teams. But I think the idea is 
really, for my my opinion, is we have to stay with our knitting. We have to build the foundation of our sport in our city fundamentally strong. We have to resonate with it, build it. We have to make sure that we are front of mind share with all the fans. Because remember, there are, I think, 14, 14 professional type teams, big ones, in Los Angeles. This isn't like some market in Toulouse or something. This is 14 teams competing for attention and intention and dollars. You gotta keep your eye on that prize. You take your eye off that prize. We decided <clears throat> strategically to move downtown on Figueroa, the main street, which is anchored by the Dodgers, the Lakers, and us on the other end. So we decided to be of the city of Los Angeles. We had a, a mantra where the, the people and the team of this city, and that's what we have to do. And I think that if we keep our eye on that prize, we'll be fine. Hey, Kurt, let me jump in here for a second because I know Peter has a hard stop. He's got to catch a flight. So, Peter, we do appreciate that. I'm just wondering with Karnak, how many MLS fans, knowing the average age is so low, they have no idea what Carson is. And then, Larry, <laughs> you mentioned the NASL. Do you? How many MLS fans even know who Giorgio Quinalia is? I was I, at I, Giant Stadium for number nine scoring his goals. But, uh, you know, we're not too sure. So, Larry, uh, why don't you stick around for a couple of minutes? Peter, we know you have to go. So thanks so much. We do appreciate it. And and by the way, I'm sure I'm going to get a text message from Jerry Cardinal taking a shot at Toulouse. He's going to say, what is going on? I bought that team for a reason. He's going to, Peter, give me a break. Hey, Larry, Larry, don't just remember one thing. Don't give up any of the secrets. No matter how they brought right. it, no secrets. All right. All right. I know we have the capability to cut Peter off when he's trying to you know limit what we do. Yeah, Larry, let me just ask you, he was talking about all those things. These clubs nowadays, and then I'll turn it back to you, Kurt, but clubs nowadays are platform companies. Nobody exists in just being a team anymore. You are the centerpiece of a media play, a real estate play, a tech play, an incubator play. How do you see it all burgeoning and then inflating the valuations even further? So let me first say that uh, the community is the big part of it for us. And so our foundation, uh, which is obviously not a for-profit, it's a not-for-profit, but the LAFC Foundation is part of the footprint and a very important part and allows us to get out into the community, put futsal courts into, into schools, et cetera. And it's all part of building the brand. It's all part of expanding the geography. So in our case, you know, I'm a private equity guy in my, in my day job. So first thing you have to do is be open uh, to equity deals and to investments. So I think Peter's right. We need to stick to our knitting for a while. We need to make that work. Um, but ultimately we're gonna you know, try a few things. Um, entrepreneurial things where we take equity instead of cash from sponsors and try to help build out their businesses to the extent they're they're small. And then over time, we'd like to think we can make some investments and put our name on some things. But, you know, first we have to really become much more well-known in LA. Everyone kind of tells us how great we're doing. The reality is it's still a minority of people that know us in Los Angeles. And we know that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to continue to, to build. We just cut a deal with, uh, Angel City, which is the NWSL team in Los Angeles, and they're gonna play in our stadium. And yes, we'll make a few bucks, but the most important thing is it's gonna bring in a whole new set of fans uh, into our stadium and get to know us. Um, so we're at the early stages of that, but yeah, 10 years from now, uh, I'd be disappointed if we don't have some uh, nice equity positions and things outside of just our soccer team and our stadium. Right. Well, so that's the, ups that's the upside we're talking about. You're saying only a few yeah. people, you have a, you have a small sliver of the market right now. So you have tremendous yeah. upside. Just a couple of quick more things uh, and we'll let you go. Uh, any updates on the stadium naming rights process where you guys are and start getting a new name? Yeah, so we have about uh, a dozen folks uh, working. Um, obviously COVID uh, really put a pause on things for two reasons, number one, the companies wanted to take a pause and kind of see how COVID played out in their own businesses. And number two, our best marketing ability is to take someone to a game. Um, anytime we take sponsors to a game, uh, it, 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 it gets a lot easier. And we weren't able to bring any fans to games until June. Um, so we really had to start back up. Um, so we have some really interesting uh, groups looking at us, everybody from, you know, the usual suspects and, you know, car companies and, uh, and the like big companies, financial services companies, but we also have some real entrepreneurial companies. Um, it seems like we have more startups and billion dollar unicorns than ever in our economy. Um, and some of them are establishing their brands. And so they look at things like this. So it's a really interesting group of folks. We hope to get something done, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, 
but it literally just started coming back over the last, you know, four to six weeks. Right. Uh, and the last one, you guys are hosting the All-Star Game next month. I, I guess I'm wondering, uh, what can we expect um, at your stadium? And then also what that means for the brand, how that helps yeah. you guys. So, look, I think the most important thing you can expect is passion. I mean, the great thing about any time the USA plays Mexico is you have a lot of passion. Ironically for us, our supporters, um, who are Angelinos and huge LAFC supporters, our real hardcore supporters, have a lot of Mexican teams they follow. Um, and when mm -hmm. the Mexican national team plays, sometimes they root, some of our fans root for them over the U.S. national team. So <laughs> it's not always obvious um, who folks are rooting for, but what you know you're going to get is the passion. So I think Los Angeles is the perfect market for it. Obviously, our demographics work really well. Um, I don't think the League of Mex has had an all-star team before, so I think people are really intrigued about it and excited about it. And I think most importantly, um, I think the players are going to care who wins. You know, I think League of Mex – the perception has been that they have definitely dominated MLS and things like the CONCACAF Champions League for a while. And over the last few years, some of their best players have been coming to the MLS. Our ability to pay players is starting to exceed them. For a long time, they had much more expensive rosters, et cetera. I think Liga Mex sees us passing them. So they're not going to want to let that go and not win the All-Star game. And clearly, we're going to feel the same way. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we've tried to establish our brand in Mexico. We did really well in the uh, CONCACAF Champions League last December. We drew uh, by just you know happenstance. We drew four Mexican teams to get to the finals, which is not always true. Um, we beat three of them, and we lost to the fourth one at the end. And that had a lot of coverage in Mexico. So as our brand, the black and gold, etc., we want to get closer and closer to that marketplace. Um, and frankly, it's it, it's like you know hand in glove with Los Angeles demographics. So uh, I'm really excited. I'm a I'm a you know lifelong big soccer fan and I, I love the whole uh u.s versus mexico rivalry and i think the more things we do with league of mex the better right. great well well larry thanks so much we could do this for hours i really appreciate your time uh thank you good luck with the game all-star game and the rest of the season my pleasure thanks for having me i am thrilled to be joined by my friend jason levian co-chairman and CEO of DC United. Jason, thanks so much for taking some time. Uh, thanks for having me, Scott. It's great to see you. When you and I first uh, encountered each other, we would talk basketball, right? You, you were uh, part owner of the Memphis Grizzlies, but then you moved on to soccer. I'm just curious, on the overarch, what attracted you to soccer before a lot of other U.S. owners? I think the big the big growth opportunity, I had been a young attorney in Washington, D.C. when D.C. United launched, and it was awesome. And the club was dominant, um, and I saw what it did to the city. Um, and then when I went on in my career and was an investor in, you know, in, in the NBA uh, and a team operator, um, I really saw where soccer was headed, and I thought there's a lot of growth here, a lot of potential uh, in the U.S. market, and it was something that I wanted to participate in. Now, everybody's heard like the kids playing soccer, but you start to get now where American fans are watching overseas soccer, uh, you get the participation. What is it you think that is the real buoy for an investment in MLS? I think, I think if you go to elementary schools today, and my son is an elementary school student, and you see the number of kids showing up in soccer jerseys, uh, whether it's MLS or other countries around the world, and what they're talking about. Um, I think you see young people engaged in the game. I think the attention span uh, and the level of excitement and, and, and uh, that goes on in a soccer match uh, is special in, in terms of holding people's attention spans. Um, so I think it's they're really onto something. I think the game of soccer in the next coming generations is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, and the, the, the amount of action there is, uh, is just very engaging for fans in the stadium and also, you know, watching on their screens. What was your knee-jerk reaction to, on the whole, Sportico's MLS valuations? And then we'll get to DC United specifically, because I already got your text message and I know where that stands. <laughs> no, I'll tell you, Scott, I, I, first of all, I'm really glad you guys are doing it. I think it's really good work. Um, I think it was thorough. I thought it was interesting. Um, I think it was needed in the marketplace for people who are looking at sports investments to have uh, the, the research that was done. I think that was really helpful. So um, that's number one. When I heard that you guys were doing this, I thought it was, I thought it was really going to add some value to the sports business landscape. Um, obviously, you know, I have my own insights because we've been raising capital uh, and bringing in some partners um, 
on the on the tail end of hopefully what is the tail end of COVID. Um, and you know, um, our our valuation has been strong, um, and it exceeds uh, by what 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 you guys put for DC United. But overall, directionally, I think that uh, there was a lot of insight there in terms of where the league is headed, in terms of where the sport is headed in the U.S. Um, and there's still challenges. Don't get me wrong. There's still obstacles and and some big challenges. I think we've got a really good leadership team at the league level that can tackle those and a strong ownership group. Um, but, but I think directionally what you guys produced, uh, is very much in line with where I feel the league is headed. Where do, where were we short? Do you think? Cause we had DC United with 630 million. You probably said we were 10 or 12% shy. It's hard. I, th- I think it's probably j- not in the numbers, not in what the analytics showed, but we may be shy on the scarcity value that's the hardest thing to value that if you want in the club you've got to pay and clearly people at your valuations were clearly willing to pay a little bit more but it's hard to value that scarcity though is that is that a huge driver in terms of pro sports i think that's a huge big factor in the people that i talk to that want to get in i think specific to dc united and and i don't i don't criticize this i think there are a lot of things going on in and around our stadium and our real estate and our sports betting licenses um, and the real estate that we have in in the state of Virginia that that adds a tremendous amount of value. And I think it's hard for someone doing a league wide valuation to tap into all that. So I think some of it is just market specific, uh, what's happening in in different markets. Um, Some of it is probably the scarcity, but I think you guys got that. I think you I think I, you know, I read the article. I, 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 you know, I I, I try to read it very carefully um, and I think you did tap into what's happening, which is that there's scarcity for sports team ownership and there's growth potential. There's a really good story to tell over the next decade to two decades of what's going to happen. And you combine those and you get you get real, real growth and valuation. I think what makes this really fun, not only for us to do on outsiders looking in, but for owners like yourself, is that there's so much opportunity because pro sports teams now, they, they used to be mom and pop organizations. But they're platform companies. They are global entertainment platform companies. And we take into account all the ancillary businesses, which includes real estate, which includes media. What do you think is the future of ownership in terms of the team being the hub of it all, the brand, but everything else that will circle around it? Scott, I think there's a massive opportunity. I, you know, when I got into this, uh, 25 years ago, I got into the sports business um, and I was representing athletes and I was negotiating with general managers and team presidents and owners. Um, and then I became an investor. Um, and I remember um, when I put a group together to buy the Grizzlies, David Stern pulled me aside and he said, you know, I don't want to scare you, but you're paying a full value for this team. You know, I hope you know that. <laughs> and that was, you know, uh, 5%, 10% of what the, I think what that club is worth now. Um, I, but what you're saying really resonates with me because when we acquired DC United, the idea was we've got this great brand in an unbelievable market, in, in an international market. We needed a home stadium. And through that process of finding a downtown urban home stadium in what's now the fastest growing area in Washington, DC, and will be the most densely populated area in DC, what I realized is the opportunities are boundless once you have the team in terms of what you can do in public-private partnerships, what you can do with media, what you can do with real estate, uh, sports gaming, obviously a massive factor there, uh, what you can do in the community that adds value in the community, but also dramatically grows your asset value. So those are all the things that, that I'm focused on now, that we're focused on at DC United is, how do we get more ingrained in the DMV, the D- DC, Maryland, Virginia area? Uh, what can we do on our real estate platform, our media platform, uh, in sports betting, um, w- what can we do in all of those areas that's driving value to the team and driving value to the overall business? And that that is something that um, originally when I got involved on the, as a team operator, I wasn't as focused on, and that's where I'm hyper-focused today. Anytime we hear about sports betting, everybody brings up the one word, engagement, right? It's, it's gonna drive engagement. Great. Tell me how you monetize engagement. Well, listen, for us specifically, we have preferential treatment to get sports betting licenses ourselves, both in D.C. and in the entire state and the state of Virginia. We've got a we've got a mobile platform for the state of Virginia that we're partnering with Betfred on. 
um, that will be statewide. Um, and that's launching very soon. Um, so in, in addition to engagement, uh, what we've done is found partnerships uh, and we're partnering with FanDuel in DC, um, an exclusive partnership with FanDuel. So we're, we're certainly focused on engagement and excitement among growing our fan base, but actually we're a participant um, in the growing industry that's sports betting and sports gaming um, and doing that in a way that we can reap real benefits economically. I think you're a great at least test case for what we're seeing in media because you did try a streaming exclusive. It didn't work out exactly as you'd hope, but what did you learn and where do you think we're going? And we're going to get to the national media deal right after this, but sure. you've been there, you've done it. What did you learn? What did your customers tell you? What worked? What didn't? Yeah, we, we it was, you know, we, we tried and, and that did not, that, that did not succeed. Um, we, we tried a partnership um, that would have been an exclusive streaming platform for regionally for our games. Um, I think what we learned is that the sports bars that a lot of our fans were congregating at weren't ready for it. Uh, they weren't ready technologically for it. Um, we, we went, we had to go bar to bar to, to try to show them how to stream the games um, and how to get the package. Um, and it was, a, it, there were some real growing pains uh, from fans who love watching, uh, watching what we're doing um, and were frustrated that we weren't on uh, on a package that they were traditionally used to on cable TV. Um, we were probably a little bit ahead of our time. We did it a couple of years ago. Um, and our fan base for the most part, I think was happy with it, but there was enough of a minority of fans that were frustrated with it, that we needed to make a change. Um, so, but I think the engagement level, what we learned from our, our customers was interesting. Uh, the data showed us that, uh, there, there's real opportunity for that and, and growth for that. Um, and it's something we're going to certainly know we know is important for us moving forward so uh probably a little ahead of our time um in doing that and but but I'm, i'd rather try and fail at those things um and really try to, to to capture uh what's happening technologically in the future in terms of how people are consuming uh our content um so so i'm glad we tried it yeah i i don't say it just to, to rub any salt and wounds I, I mean you really were a little ahead because if you look now any big time streaming event, you still see problems in almost all of them. And maybe it's just not there yet. Do you believe the fangs or the other, do you think that streaming will at least emerge as an equal player in terms of broadcast rights or when will it happen? Or are we still right now stuck on the linear? I think, I think the linear players are certainly investing in streaming. Um, so that they can combine both platforms. Uh, so I, I think it's trending in the streaming direction. Certainly that's the, where the growth is. Um, but you, you still have, there's a lot of advantages to linear. And so there are a lot of advantages to being on both. Uh, I, guess, I guess if we learned anything in our regional market was in DC was, should we have uh, figured out a way just to be on both so that we weren't you know, upsetting anybody and we were getting the advantages of the streaming for those who wanted to take advantage of it. All right, tell me about the national talks now. You're an owner. You are probably having regular talks with Commissioner Garber. How are the talks going? Because I would assume also some of the valuation that you're seeing are prospective owners banking on what we saw in the NFL, what we hear about could be in the NBA, significant increases across all sports for content, content, content. They just got to have it. I, listen, I think that's right. I think it's a great time right now to be in MLS. It's, it's, it's probably the best time since I've been in the league. This is my 10th season. Um, why? Number one, and, and, and I will say that we've got labor peace. We, we, we struck a really good labor deal that I think um, the players and the owners, and I give a lot of credit to, to our commissioner uh, for getting that deal over the line. I know it wasn't easy in the middle of COVID. Um, yeah. I, I but, think but people I, overlooked in the NFL. One of the reasons for that massive NFL contract, yes, we know that's the gorilla out there, but the fact that they secured that 10-year labor deal prior to the discussions, the, the, the broadcast uh, networks felt comfortable they could go out and spend because they knew it would be there. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and so that's, that's a huge advantage for us right now, just like the, you mentioned with the NFL. Number two, um, we've got an unbelievable ownership group. Uh, you know, we've got committed owners, we've got deep pocketed owners with resources, with relationships in the media space uh, and beyond. Um, so I think that that bodes really well for us. Um, and then and then obviously, uh, number three is we've got a great growth story to tell. Um, and, and a big part of that growth story is the next media deal. Um, I think that 
the work that's being laid over the last couple of years, not just with Don Garber, but with Mark Abbott and with Gary Stevenson really uh, running point on it with his experience um, and our, you know, our ownership committees that are, that are working on it, I think we're really well positioned. And you're right, the, the content uh, demand is there. Um, we, we have a lot to prove uh, in terms of growing our fan base, but I think we're doing that. Um, and I think that this is a really good moment for us. And we've got, you know, we're not under the gun in terms of our media rights deal in terms of getting it done in the very short term. Um, and there are a lot of players, new players and existing players emerging uh, that, that I think will be interested. Since you're in D.C., let's stick with a, uh, a Washington thing of follow the money in Watergate. You know, I, I love the line. I always follow the money. Where's the smart money going? I would be pretty comfortable if I saw David Tepper moving in a direction, the Wilfs, the Haslams. What does it say, if anything? Maybe it's just the price for entry is lower than the other leagues they're already a part of. But what does it say that those are the people already involved in sports and other leagues coming into MLS as well? Makes me feel really good. I got to tell you, a lot of people smarter than me. Uh, you know, my partner in D.C., Steve Kaplan, one of the smartest people I, I, I've known, uh, one, one of my closest friends, uh, when he decided to jump into the league and join me in 2018, uh, that made me feel great. Um, I, think, I think that's happening because, listen, this is a league that's only in its 26th year. Um, and you look back at some of these other pro sports leagues where they were in their 26th year, and you think about the growth, you think about the demographics of the United States and people who are being born in this country, coming to this country, what their passion is for our sport. Um, and, and the wind is at our back. Uh, we certainly have to execute um, to, be, to really be effective in terms of growing the interest and excitement level of the sport and the league. Um, but we're there. We really have a massive opportunity to do that. And so you're right, when you think about the people investing and um, why they're making that investment, um, it, it becomes clear that there's a massive growth opportunity here in year 26 in Major League Soccer. Since you brought up the changing demographics of the country, let me ask about Liga MX. Insane numbers in the U.S. and Spanish language TV only. We keep hearing about the possibility of MLS Liga MX merger. Where do you stand? Do you see it as a, a viable option or something that could happen? You know, I don't think it's really binary. Um, I don't think it's, you know, we stay in our lane, they stay in their lane, or we merge. I, where I see it is the growth of the collaboration between the leagues, um, I think can really advantage both leagues. Um, and I think the growth of the collaboration uh, of clubs in, you know, playing each other in competition is going to be really valuable. Um, so I see that moving forward. I think that'll add value uh, to what we're doing in MLS. I think it'll add value to League of Mex. And, and you know, you're seeing some cross ownership now. You're seeing some investment in Liga MX from the U.S. Um, I think those relationships uh, add value to, to, the, to the growth uh, of, of both leagues and to the opportunities that will exist for the collaboration to continue. What's your response to skeptics? I won't say critics, the skeptics who would say, let's look at the multiples of revenue that are being paid for these franchises and say it's sort of out of whack with what you see in the other leagues. Yeah, I think, I think that if you don't believe in the growth story, if you don't believe that soccer is growing in the U.S., that MLS is, is, has, has a really strong growth trajectory, um, if you, then, then, then this isn't the league for you, right? Then, then go measure it against leagues that are 100 years old and say, what's the, what's the revenue multiple? Um, but this is about where the opportunity lies. This is about looking around the corner and saying, where is that growth trajectory? Where does soccer fit in to Gen Zers? Who are how are they consuming their content you know how long and i mentioned earlier how long is their attention span what is the amount of action you're going to see in 90 minutes in a soccer game um and so when if you believe that growth story you're not tied to the traditional metrics you're looking at different metrics you're looking at gross growth play and you're thinking about where uh the country is going uh where the league is going and where the sport is growing um and and the demand for it internationally is there so, so that's what draws me to the league. That's what drew me 10 years ago. I think the quality of play has gotten so much better, Scott. I look back at the team we had in 2012, my first year, and we got to the conference finals. And I said, this is going to be easy. You know, we, were, we were almost host of the MLS Cup. But, but I look at that team, and I'm not sure there's a single starter on that team that would start for us today because the quality of play in the United States and in MLS from international players coming in has gotten so much better and the league has gotten younger. 
and, and more vibrant and, and the, the quality of coaching has gotten better. Um, so the product is just rising and rising and growing. And I'll tell you, as a team operator, we've got to keep up with that. There are a lot of challenges there because when the LAFCs and the Atlanta Uniteds get in the league and you see the kind of resources they're putting behind their strategies for success, um, certainly there's a challenge there. But overall, the product is just unbelievably growing and improving. All right, I'll get you out of here on this. Clearly, in your NBA days, you learned the value of star power. You know what a star does and can drive. You had Wayne Rooney at DC United. What was the short-term effect, long-term effect? Did you see a bounce? Did you see a day? Or do you see a day where the top names in soccer are playing in this league? I, I do see that day because of the economic engine that is the United States and the, the, the people that are living in this country and, and where this country is headed. I do see that day. Wayne Rooney, overall, I think it was a real success for us. Um, it had an opportunity not to be. Um, you know, he was 32 years old when he came in the league. He had a lot of wear on his tires. We didn't know how much more soccer he had in him. We knew he was unbelievably gifted as a player. He created moments that people talk about today. I was at the game uh, last night, and people were saying, I was there when Wayne Rooney, you know, did X, Y, and Z when he – he chipped the keeper from 80 yards. Um, he created moments that are indelibly linked to our franchise and our fan base. Um, he created excitement. I think you're going to see younger and younger stars coming in the league. You're already seeing that. Um, as we become, MLS becomes more engaged in the world soccer market, player market. Um, but yeah, I think you're going to see stars in their prime wanting to be in MLS in the next decade. Um, and that's really exciting. I think that's going to drive eyeballs internationally. We've talked a lot about, you know, the media rights deal. We're talking about the domestic rights. We're talking about the hundreds of millions of Americans who might want to watch the sport. But I think when you start seeing those stars in their 20s coming into our league um, and the excitement they're going to bring internationally, I think you're going to start looking at the media rights differently because you've got a whole market for international media rights in soccer that you may not have in other sports. Um, and that's going to be a key driver over the next 10 to 20 years right before we do next year's valuations you'll write your value on a piece of paper i'll write mine with absolutely no advanced knowledge from kurt badenhausen closest without going over get to dinner at old ebbets grill i'm in i'm in sounds great man thanks guys all right jason levy and co-chairman and ceo of dc united thanks so much my friend enjoy it I'm excited to be joined by Merritt Paulson, the majority owner of the Portland Timbers and Portland Thorns. Welcome, Merritt. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, so this year, you guys are celebrating 10 years since your, your first game in MLS. You know, you're part of the old guard now, right? Kind of feels that way. I mean, it wasn't that long ago when I you know, had hair and stood next to Don Garber announcing our expansion uh, bid uh, in, in 2010. Um, you know, it's, it's crazy now when you look at all these new teams coming in and the new stadiums being built and it's been a, it's been a pretty good ride for the last 10 years. And I think, a, I, I think a pretty significant phase in the growth cycle of, of MLS and soccer in America. Yeah, so I mean, I guess if you, you look at this decade, if you were to, if you were to take yourself back to that time, I'm wondering, you, you fast forward to 2021, obviously been different last 18 months. I don't think you would have foreseen that uh, by any stretch. Uh, but but are the Timbers and MLS where, where you thought they would be a decade ago? Or are they exceeded expectations? Are there areas where, you know, they've fallen short? I, I think I had high expectations um, and, and really felt that the world's game was going to be arriving, um, you know, in this country. But I think the rate at which has occurred, at which that has occurred, has been faster than I might have guessed. I mean, there were people, you know, just to give you context, who thought I was absolutely crazy uh, when we were making a big bet on MLS and we removed AAA baseball to do it. And, uh, you know, so, so now that looks like an obvious thing when you look at everything that the Timbers and the Thorns have, have become in Portland and North America, um, you know, but but it, it, at the time it still seemed extremely speculative um, for a lot of people. And you look at where franchise valuations were at that point in time, uh, 
you know, as well, it was, it was a, a totally different uh, universe. But Seattle had launched a couple years earlier. They'd had tremendous success a little north, you know, of us. And there was no doubt in my mind that Portland was going to carve out its own niche in this country. Um, and I think sort of redefine what a North American atmosphere could be like, uh, you know, for, for, for soccer. And we've done that. Uh, and, you know, I think the next, next decade is going to be equally as interesting in some ways. Well, I, I hope when, when these control stakes are being sold for more than $400 million and you got minority sales at $700 million, you text those people back that, that doubted you with, with a copy of those stories. Um, I'm wondering, you know, every sports team or, or brand in general, whether you're, whether you're talking about Apple, Adidas, Uber, I mean, everybody is trying to get fan customer engagement, um, raise those metrics. You guys typically, you know, near the top of MLS every year, whether it's attendance ratings, any of these, those engagement uh, metrics, I'm wondering what, what's, what's the secret sauce for you guys? You know, if there was a, just a, a, a easy to define formula, everybody would be doing it. I mean, we've woven <laughs> ourselves into the fabric of this community in a unique way. And I think it really does start with the atmosphere. And the game atmosphere here is so special and it's so unique. Um, and, and then you look at the work we do in and around the community, um, the way that we've marketed ourselves in a way that doesn't feel like marketing it feels authentic and it's very true to the you know what portland is and and and, and kind of who our fans are um the staff we've hired i i think that often people just assume it's soccer city usa tickets sell themselves um but you know that's just not the case i mean we've got a great culture and a, and, and a great staff the way we launched the thorns um, and, and kind of position the thorns not as a niche product um, aimed at, um, you know, moms and their daughters, but rather, you know, a top caliber professional soccer um, product. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'd say a combination of, of all of those things. Uh, but, you know, this year we're actually, our local market ratings are going to be up uh, over 25%. Um, from uh, th their all-time highs. I mean, we're, we're, we're setting new records. We've still got uh, a half a season to play, but, you know, in the, in the you know, new era of, of, of rating deflation, you know, when you look at all the um, uh, segmentation and, you know, the, the, the fragmentation of that, the media audience, I mean, that's a pretty remarkable stat in and of itself. I mean, we're, we're still, um, you know, very much in growth mode. Uh, and I'm wondering maybe if you talk about how the, the renovation you guys completed in 2019 fits into um, that engagement model and a better customer experience for your fans. So that was a product of the fact that when we launched in, in 2011, we made the decision that we were going to have the largest supporter section by some large margin of any of the stadiums in Major League Soccer, roughly 6,000 general admission seats with ticket prices that were basically artificially deflated. And I felt that was marketing. You know, I mean, we, mm -hmm. the brand is so tied to the unique atmosphere here. But uh, because of that, you know, we were light on premium inventory and we had so much pent up and unfulfilled demand um, for season tickets uh, that, you know, we sort of looked at, at, at the alternatives and I didn't want to take away those GA seats, um, you know, and, and, you know, I didn't know if we had a footprint that we really could do much with expansion, but we found a pretty creative solution that allowed us to, you know, add some, some premium seats um, with amenities. Um, and, you know, we had, as I mentioned, we, I think we had 15,000 people on a waiting list um, you know, that required a $50 uh, uh, deposit. So it was a real, a real waiting list and to, you know, get some more people season tickets because, you know, th the one thing is for this sport, you can't truly appreciate it on, I, I, I think, you know, it translates better to TV now than it ever has, but it's still the ultimate live game experience. And we weren't cycling enough people in our, even in our own community into basically mm -hmm. taste 
you know, what a Timbers game was like or what a Thorns game was like. And, you know, we needed that excess inventory. And, uh, you know, I think the expansion, if you told me we were going to be doing it, um, you know, up against a global pandemic, <laughs> we may have rethought it. But I think that, that you know, we, we completed it, obviously, in 2019. And 2020 was going to be our, you know, our normal season. And, you know, 2020 was 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 anything but normal. Um, but I think it's going to, in long term, uh, you know, in, in a long term, with a long term view, it's going to look like a, a good decision. I, I, I want you, you bring up the thorns. And I want to talk about them. And, and maybe now it seems obvious that you'd invest in, and build a club like the thorns. But but when the team launched, maybe not so obvious. You guys were the on, only MLS club uh, that decided to invest in uh, the NWSL. Uh, so I, w what was behind that? And then if you could get into how the two clubs work together on the business side and the synergies, whether you're talking about sponsorships, uh, driving fans to games. Yep. Uh, so in it, it, the league came about pretty quickly in 2012. Sunil Gulati, who was then uh, head of U.S. soccer, called a number of MLS owners and said, look, we're relaunching women's professional soccer. We absolutely need some MLS ownership in the league. Would you take a look at this? And I think I got the first call from him around Halloween and they, you know, in, in 2012, and we were talking about a 2013 launch. And I was well aware of the fact that prior to women's professional leagues didn't make it past three years. We were on the cusp of, you know, we had a pretty disappointing second year on the pitch um, on the men's side, we'd made a coach change. We had our hands full on, you know, sort of getting the product right on the field and being a playoff team, um, you know, and, and uh, so, you know, I was actually pretty reticent um, uh, to, to, you know, do a whole new initiative. Um, but I said, look, we'll take a, a, a close look at it. I knew that uh, University of Portland women's Collegiate soccer had been the most successful, has been the most successful um, uh, NCAA women's team in terms of drawing an audience. The U.S. women's team had had really successful events here. We have figured if it, if it wasn't going to work in Portland, it wasn't going to work anywhere. And the bigger, you know, the deeper the dive I did, the more I realized, look, it's not a product problem. There was, a, you know, the, the league wasn't set up in the right way. It didn't have the right owners. And I, I thought, let's do this thing and let's do it right. And uh, again, we're going to position this thing as just a top tier uh, pro soccer product. We're not going to nicheify it. And we're going to put the Thorns logo up on the building, the same size as the Timbers logo. Um, and, you know, we had our best case scenario, our, our scenario um, that I thought was probably more or less expected in our worst case scenario, which I could live with. And we doubled our best case scenario out of the gate and it's been nothing but growth ever since it's been one of the most rewarding things we've done because the team's really been a beacon of light for what women's pro sports um can be not just in soccer but in any sport in many ways the thorns are the most successful women's professional sports team anywhere in the world and so uh you know look the sky's the limit and now that the league's really stabilized and and, and started to hit growth mode um, you know, I think the sky's the limit um, for what the NWSL can be. But in terms of the way the two teams are working together, that's been interesting because we always had the benefit of synergies of facilities and some, you know, sponsorship sellers and ticket sellers. And we hired our own discreet sporting staff um, for the Thorns out of the gate. Um, but I, really on, on the sponsorship side, um, you know, there's been a quite a few synergies going forward. A, a, a lot of brands, um, you know, are just as interested in affiliating with the um, with the Thorns as they are the Timbers for, for good reason right now. And we're uniquely positioned, I think, as a club that, that can give exposure to a top men's brand and a top women's brand. And there's no question that having both clubs is helping us sell. Uh, on the ticket side, there's been benefit as well. Um, but we've also found our own discrete audience for the Thorns, which in the 21st biggest market, not one of the biggest markets in the country, has been pretty interesting in and of itself. And I think that Thorns have helped with fan creation. There's been actual Thorns fans that have become interested in the Timbers because of the Thorns. 
Um, and it was easier to get a ticket to the Thorns than it was the Timbers. Um, you know, and so it's been very additive and, um, you know, a, a, a great marriage, so to speak, between the two clubs. And so, so what do you think the rest of the NWSL has to do to, to catch up to what you guys are doing with the Thorns? Well, they're doing good things already. I mean, there's, there's teams that are much stronger than they were um, in the past. And, you know, I mean, just by virtue of the fact that we're going into our ninth season at this point, you know, and it's not a question of if the league's going to be a going concern. It's really now a question of how big the league's going to be. Um, you know, there have been a bunch of wins. And look, the Thorns have been a big part of that. But other teams are starting to punch above their weight. And I think that we do need, in, in my mind, it, we will get some teams that are averaging um, 12, 13, 14, 15,000 fans a game. And I think when you look at some of the expansion teams that uh, have interest in joining the team, I'm very bullish on their prospects. Um, you know, you've got Angel City making a lot of waves. Um, you know, through their partnership with LAFC um, right now. And we also have, um, you know, some incumbent teams that, that um, you know, have been thinking a little more ambitious, you know, and how they're setting themselves up. But it's, it, it's always been hard to do it if you don't have the infrastructure. And I think getting more MLS teams involved, um, you know, is, is, is part of the answer to that question. You bring up Portland as the 21st biggest market in the U.S., um, we had you ranked seventh amongst MLS clubs in terms of valuation, 635 million. Everybody in front of you is in a very major uh, metro market. Uh, you think that's, is that the right price? Is that the right order? You think you guys, in terms of, uh, from a valuation standpoint? Well, look, I mean, the, the valuation, um, uh, it, it, ultimately, teams are worth what people are going to pay for them, right? So it, it's a hard thing. To, to, You're not selling, right? No, and we and we have no interest in, in in selling. But I think you raise a good question about market size because um, I I think there's big advantages to having a a larger mindset share and a larger relevancy um, in a market. I mean that certainly is a it's a net positive. Um, um, with regard to revenue generation, ticket sales, sponsorship sales, um, you know, it's 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 harder. It's been harder for some of the incumbent, really big market teams to get out of that old MLS 1.0 mode, and and you know they're competing with a lot of other professional um, uh, sports franchises. Uh, I I think that Portland's going to continue to be a growth market um, in general. Um, you know, and a lot of people continue to move here, even despite the challenges we've had. Um, through COVID, it's an attractive spot to live. It's well positioned from a climate standpoint, um, et, et cetera. But I'd rather own a club that's a lot more relevant in, in a slightly small, smaller market than a club where you're really having to kick and screen to get anybody to notice you, you know, in one of the bigger markets. So, um, you know, I, I, I get the trade offs and, and, you know, look, I think you guys had LAFC as number one and, um, you know, they've done a great job in a really big market and, and there's no question that LAFC are very, very relevant. Um, but, uh, you know, I see some real advantages uh, to being in a market our size. I think actually the metric population per pro sports team, Portland's like two or three in the country. You know, it's just the Blazers and us. Right, right. that's important. Yeah, I talked to Austin, That they talked about that being part of, part of their success is they're the only game in town, and it was an area that was dying for pro sports franchise. Well, it's um, UT, UT in them, right? I mean, you well, know, that's true. Yeah. I say one professional franchise, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. one semi-professional franchise, uh, but it is the dominant force down there. Uh, we had Commissioner Garber on earlier, and he was talking about um, how we're going to see private equity investment coming to MLS. We, we've seen you know, a, a lot of celebrities wanting to get into the sport. Um, buy minority stakes, and, and that can be advantageous in terms of um, raising awareness. Um, is is that something? Are, are you guys looking at that at all, or are you guys comfortable with where where you are in terms of the ownership structure of the uh, of the Timbers? Well, historically, I mean, through ten years, we've been one of the few teams that's been one hundred percent owned by by one group, which is which is our family. Um, I think it's possible. Uh, 
you know, we might do some some minority um, ownership in the coming years. There's definitely advantages there. You know, the celebrity thing's interesting because it's typically not about financial flexibility as it is about the buzz it can create. And I don't take that for, for granted, but in Portland, we don't need the, the buzz as much. <laughs> like, look, if Damian Lillard were to suddenly be really interested in getting involved with the clubs, would, would I listen 100%? But, um, you know, I'm not out soliciting celebrity ownership and celebs typically want equity just for their brand name and their ability to tweet without putting a lot of money. That hasn't always been the case with the celebrities that have joined MLS, but that's not something that, you know, we, we need or, you know, I think would have as much value in Portland as it would in L.A. Right, right. You, you, you talked about the success in, in the local market and. I, I'm wondering how you how you take that success, whether it's Portland or the other these other clubs that have been really successful locally, and, and now how do you take that nationally and then ultimately internationally is the ultimate goal. Well, I mean, it's been interesting for us. I mean, it's not it's a little bit of a deviation from your specific question, but but we, we've built more of a national audience. I mean, we have more fan groups and. New York City and t Texas and you know there's a big one in Montana. We've got a big UK um, Portland uh, uh, Timbers uh, fan group and one in Japan. Believe it or not, um, you know and, and so just as a club, um, you know because of maybe it's the cool factor, or maybe it's the fact that we've got a guy with a chainsaw, you know, uh, <laughs> slabs off a log every time we we we, we score a goal. I don't know what it is. Um, but, and you look, the Galaxy have a big brand. I just came back from a trip in Africa with my family and, you know, based on David Beckham, you know, uh, uh, being a player there and, and, you know, maybe because of Zlatan and other things, there's no question that they've got a very big brand um, internationally. But I think, you know, from a league standpoint, um, the quality of play has to continue to go up, honestly. Um, and, and we've got to show that we can compete and be other leagues in the world. And I, I, I think that you'll start to see the, the, the league brand and the team's brand um, continue to rise. And, and that's something that's very important. Yeah, I, that, the, the people I talk to, they say, you gotta spend money. You gotta spend money. You gotta spend money if you wanna catch up from a talent base to catch up to these other local yep. leagues around, around the world. Um, I, I'll let you go, but uh, uh, one last one, and, and I guess, you know, overall state of the play as someone, again, old guard, been around for 10 years. You've seen a lot with MLS and there's a lot of moving parts right now. We've got the World Cup coming, new TV deals coming, you've got new ownership coming in. Your you know, overall state of the play where MLS is right now. I think we're in a great position, uh, in an enviable position with a massive opportunity in, with 2026 and the World Cup coming. I mean, you remember the last time we hosted a World Cup in this country. That was basically what what caused the birth of of, of um, MLS. Now it's a point, you know, where, where are we going to maximize this opportunity and turbocharge the league? I mean, I think that the biggest opportunity we have uh, is really not in expansion as it has been, as it is about getting some of these bigger markets right that we have incumbent teams, you know, original MLS teams in really big markets, which for whatever reason, for whatever reason, you know, still haven't, um, you know, maximized their opportunity. I think we've got to figure that out. It, it, it's a league. I mean, we, we should be driving and you see great things happening. I think, you know, I'll give an example. Um, Chicago with Joe Mansueto, I think you've got an ambitious owner in a really big market who's going to be doing the right things to make Chicago a relevant team. Um, and, and he's already extricated himself from a bad stadium situation. Um, and I, I, I think ultimately Chicago will be a team. It's a great soccer market. I'm, I'm optimistic that Boston, which is also a great soccer market, but is fighting into the wind as long as they're, you know, out at Gillette. Um, I, I think that, that, that that's one that has an opportunity you know, to really do what Sporting Kansas City um, has done in Kansas City, which is taking um, an old incumbent um, market that was a you know brand that that, that wasn't necessarily relevant and and um, 
and making it thus, you know, making it a leader in the league. And I think doing that with some of the bigger markets in the league is something that we have to do. Excellent. Well, Merritt, thanks so much for taking time out of your day to join us. I really appreciate the time today. I enjoyed it. Uh, thank you and appreciate the work you guys do. Thank you. I got to say, watching Merritt Paulson, I owe everybody an apology. I have a, a cadre of soccer scarves somewhere in the closet, and I didn't think to wrap myself in whether it be an NYCFC or LAFC or DC United. I've got them all and I forgot to put it on for that. So that's my fault. I apologize. I'll make it up on the next time. We do like to say here at Sportico that we are a platform for thought leaders. And if you're talking MLS and you are collecting people like Don Garber, Don Garber, Larry Berg, Peter Guber, Jason Levian, Merritt Paulson, that proves out our thesis. And there's great value in that. So we do want to point out that our subscription service did launch recently. So there's a chance that you went to click on some of the articles and you hit our paywall. We see great value in what we're providing. We do encourage you all to join our community because that is what we are really building at Sportico, a community of thought leaders. And our MLS valuations was just our latest example of collecting the best and brightest in the sports business industry. So for Kurt Badenhausen, I say thank you very much for joining us. And we do look forward to seeing you on our next Sportico Live. Community.